Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning to our friends on the West Coast. I'm David Best. I'm President and CEO of Agilon, and I'm here to introduce uh, Doug Coswell, President and CEO of Advisor Solutions, who's going to talk to us today about the amazing Advisor platform. Advisor and Agilon partnered uh, some months ago and have a strategic alliance to bring this tool set to the power of the Agilon database combined with analytics, data visualization, and, and uh, the overall reporting mechanisms that they can provide. And we're doing this seminar webinar today primarily focused on complex campaign management and the types of insights that this tool set can bring to the campaign and prospect data that Agilon does. And I'm going to uh, hand over to Doug in just a moment, but I wanted to give him a little bit of background in terms of um, his, his qualifications. He's very impressive with a degree in physics and engineering from Dartmouth, an MBA from Harvard, and over 15 years in the business intelligence sector, including uh, consulting with Bain and Booz Allen. And he's an amazing talent, and one of the reasons that uh, Agilon has partnered with Advisor is his uh, forward thinking and, and best practice knowledge of this space. So without further ado, we'll hand over the session to Doug Coswell at Advisors. So thanks, David. That was a very kind introduction. Uh, yes, I'm going to take 30, 45 minutes and just talk through you know, accessing data from the Agilon system and other sources that you might have, blending it together, synthesizing, and turning it into useful information for finding prospects, for managing prospect pipelines, and setting up campaign uh, expectations, and then managing campaigns. So it's going to be at that level. Uh, we do other work at annual giving, but that's probably overload for today. So I like to start with uh, kind of high level. Uh, we're talking about you know acquiring data and managing it, which is what Agilon does really well. It's a really great system for getting data in and storing it in a well-formatted way. We then front those kinds of systems and allow people to do data discovery and analysis to look at things, to explore things, to slice and dice lists, to drill down into detail and then empower you know, end users to do that. So you know, we have authors who will work with data and create metrics and then push it out to end users who might be field officers, they might be major giving management, they might be campaign, campaign planners, who are then using that data to make decisions, which then might also drive you know, the kind of stuff you want to collect and what you do with it. So high level, that's what we're talking about. And I like to jump in at the data level. So if you're pulling data together and the question is, what are the characteristics of my larger donors and who else has those characteristics? There's a set of information in the core system, uh, Agilon, where there's entities. There's a table of facts on entities, and that usually includes things like you know, biographical and geographical information, are they married where they live? Uh, typically, you've got wealth screening scores in there. It's not just a ton of data at the zip code level you can bring in to get some aspect of wealth. Uh, class year affiliation, those kinds of things are generally there. There's a bunch of other data, for example, degrees, which by itself is useful, but it can be synthesized into do the people have an advanced degree? Uh, is there an MBA, a, a JD or an MD? Because those are obviously indicators of probably higher earning jobs and some wealth. Uh, if you look at employment, by itself it's a list of employers and titles and but out of that, you can figure out, you know, do they have a C-level job? You can match out in title, is it president or chairman or something? You can figure out the field of work. So those are more facts about people that can help answer the questions about what makes up my larger donors and who else has those same characteristics. Student activities is another one where there's a bunch of data uh, by itself, one thing, but you can figure out how many sports did they play, you know, how many activities, and generally the more of these they did, the more engaged they were as students. You can also parse out some student sports and activities might create more engagement or attachment than others, and you can model that and figure that out out of the student activities table. And then there's giving, which is a bunch of giving transactions, but if you're looking at answering those questions, you probably want to look at how many of the last five years they made a gift, you know, zero to five. You might say a gift over 100 bucks or 50 bucks or something to you know, get more substantial gifts or whatever you want to do. Those are different ways of, we would call synthesizing giving into metrics that can help understand characteristics of larger donors. You might then want to look back, you know, six to ten years. So if both of those were five, they made a gift in all the last of ten years. If, if, if you know, there was zero, they haven't made a gift, or maybe what the maximum gift is. 
this is examples of taking the data that's in Agilon. Some of it may be in other tables, and you can bring them together and then synthesizing it into uh, useful information for answering questions like this. Uh, there's other data. Uh, it's called, some other consultants call it dark data. You know, I call it other stuff. For example, event attendance. Sometimes it's in the core system, sometimes it's not. But that's got a bunch of information on how many events have they come to in the last five years, you know, the last six to ten years. Um, what types of events? You know, it's some events create more engagement and attachment than others, and you can figure that out and put weights on it, um, group by type. Um, volunteer committees might be another type of committee or event. Sometimes it's in an event table, committees table, but that's also helpful because now they're more engaged on a regular basis. On newsletter click-throughs, you know, most of our clients, uh, we have several hundred clients in fundraising, don't collect detailed newsletter click-throughs. I was at one yesterday that does. And this is great information because it's your people telling you, are they interested in what you're messaging to them? So you can figure out, you know, how many newsletter clicks have they done in the last 12 months, the last six months. This has a fairly short tail. You know, if they clicked on a newsletter three years ago, it doesn't matter. But if it's recent, they're telling you they're interested. And also by what they're clicking on, the articles uh, which you can match out on the naming or, you know, more sophisticated um, people in this space are actually keying the names into theme groups. So if they continually click on the neuroscience research that the university is doing, they're probably interested in neuroscience research. If they always click on the football team, they're interested in sports. So this is giving you not only an indication of how interested they are, but what they're interested in for appealing uh, to those interest areas. You're obviously going to more uh, succeed than if you don't. Uh, there's reunion surveys, which often have bunch of content, depending on how they're done, on interest and relationships. On the healthcare side, there's, we're doing a lot more work with uh, patient encounter data. And similarly to this kind of stuff, you know, what the actual experience was in the healthcare provider has a lot to do with their engagement or attachment and how likely they are to give. And then there's a bunch of social media stuff that's getting a lot of visibility by some. You know, th it's valuable. Um, we would tend to see every time we model this that these other things kind of outweigh the social media, but if you can get it and add it in, great. Uh, I would advise probably trying to get this stuff more systematic first. Um, but that's sort of the range of things we see. And then, you know, when you pull it together, uh, we can create, uh, blend and synthesize this. And then in the entity table, we have facts about all these aspects of, of, of a prospect, um, which run from who they are, how they've engaged, how much they've engaged, what their capacity is, and that's sort of the whole set of things that we look at when we're looking at finding prospects. And uh, I love this chart. It's from the Gartner Group, uh, which is one of the business intelligence industry analysts. And as you set this stuff up, um, I think this is just what we do. Uh, you take the raw data, newsletter, click-throughs, event attendance. You have to explore it. And you want to create hypotheses on what looks like it might be impacting attachment or capacity or, or inclination or whatever the thing you're looking for is. You have to do some transformations, as we saw in the prior chart. You know, the raw data by itself is raw data. It needs to be bid and grouped into something. You can improve the data, sometimes add in more stuff, newsletter click-throughs. Maybe you have to go back to the vendor and get more detail. This iterates. Um, so they say, you know, data science experiments, data discovery analytics. There's a set of things you can do in here. But out of this comes this knowledge gained, reusable transformations, which once you get that, you know, all this stuff on the prior page uh, can be embedded in the system. And so in our application, once you figure out what these metrics should be and how to weight them, we can create composite scores. You'll see this in a minute. And every day, uh, we'll load the data from Agilon. If there's newsletter click-throughs in a spreadsheet or a text file or somewhere else or a reunion survey somewhere, we can grab that at the same time and redo all the binning, all the synthesis, and then update scores. And so if somebody you know, came to a reunion over the weekend, clicked on the newsletter 16 times, um, went to some event and gave a gift, they're going to jump way up you know, in, in attachment or engagement when you next look at the score because the factors underneath changed over the weekend. So that's the gist of this. Uh, and that's sort of you know, however you do the work, you know, it's this kind of a process is key to get in and really understand what you've got. So we use the data 
and in working with Agilon uh, with their clients, we're using it today across a variety of levels. Senior management, VP, Dean, Provost, uh, campaign results, you'll see a little bit of this later on, snapshots and scorecards, help them answer ad hoc questions. Um, so in this case, you know, maybe you're looking at an overall campaign and the law school looks like it's doing pretty well, but it's got five programs and one program is doing great and four programs aren't. I mean, it's a quick drill down and you might say in the four programs that aren't, the problem is we're not getting alumni, we're getting you know, organizations and parents but, or whatever, but we're not getting alumni. Leadership giving we're going to drill into a bit and we're going to look at metrics for um, coaching major gift officers and trying to get a team focus on maximizing a portfolio. We also do a bunch of work of pushing stuff out to field officers so they can get, you know, lists for their trip to going to Atlanta next week and who should I visit? You know, who are the people that are my top prospects who haven't been visited in over a year, who uh, are lapsed annual fund donors and who live in Atlanta. I want the list. I want to go visit them. Annual giving, we do a bunch of work on looking at appeals and which ones are working with which groups of people and all of that. I'm going to dive in in a minute and look at prospect research at finding prospects and you know assigning them out to major giving and and we also you know a more sophisticated analyst with our in our world can build models and create all the data synthesis and scores that we were looking at just a minute ago so I'm going to dive into two examples major giving and campaign in a major giving um, we're going to look at you know five key metrics and and I will caveat this by saying you know, often we see an overfocus on visits and activities. A lot of teams get all excited about you know, how many visits have we made this fiscal year to date. We see this a lot. And it's right now August, so it's probably not many. And in June, it's probably quite a bit. And that can get abused. We'll see that in a minute. We think these five better capture um, how to manage a pool of major giving prospects. Prospect assignments are all of our highest capacity and most engaged prospects staffed. And are the pools reasonably sized? I'll look at that in a minute. Then once they're assigned, is our pool of assigned prospects being connected with in a reasonable period? Like if I have 100 prospects in a year, I ought to be able to connect with you know 80% of them, 80, 85. If I'm connecting with 50% of them, something's wrong. I ought to be able to connect with 80 to 85 percent of them and visit half of them. Uh, and if I'm not doing that, um, maybe there's a reason, um, but there ought to be a discussion. Movement. Are we moving prospects forward at a reasonable pace? You know, some field officers will get prospects stuck in qualification, and there's ways to move past that. Uh, some, you know, get the solicitation out but have trouble closing. Um, so you want to look at this and bring help in and bring best practices in where it can be applied. And solicitation levels. I actually asked this at a talk uh, a month uh, back in June, uh, are, are you doing this? Are you looking at the asks at the right level relative to capacity and attachment? And very few people were. The thing here is if I have a bunch of you know 10 million plus capacity people who are highly engaged, I ought to be raising a lot more money than somebody who's got you know a bunch of million to five million dollar prospects who are lightly engaged. Uh, and so just looking at what I'm asking without comparing it to the potential of the prospect, I could be leaving money on the table. And so if you take, for example, a person with a million dollar capacity, if they're highly engaged, you know, an appropriate ask might be half a million dollars. The same million dollar person who's disconnected and they've not been to events, uh, they've never been on a committee, they've not they've missed the last six reunions, an appropriate gift from, from that person might be twenty thousand dollars just to get them in play. They're they're wealthy but they're really not engaged. So to get a half million dollar gift is far less likely. And so when we look at pools, we want to really get our teams looking at are we soliciting at the right level? And then along with that, are we closing solicitations at an aggressive level? And these go together. Uh, we've seen this was at a team uh, a couple weeks ago where the field officers had really high yields. I think they were closing fifty to sixty percent of their asks, but they were under asking. And I could do that. If I have a million dollar prospects who are highly engaged and my job is yield, I'm asking them twenty thousand bucks, I guarantee I can get a whole bunch of them closed, but I might be leaving, you know, four hundred thousand a four fifty a, a you know prospect on the table. So yield by itself is, is not good without looking at the solicitation levels and all these other things. So we're gonna dive into these and look at some examples, but high level um, 
when we do work in this area, these are the kinds of things we love to see the teams focused on. And the good news, a system like Agilon can track and provide all of the data that you need to do this kind of work. So uh, prospect assignments, look at this first. Are all of our highest capacity, most engaged prospect staff? Are the pools reasonably sized? So this is an example of a, we call it a project. If I click on it, it'll come live. I think I clicked on the wrong thing. So this is a web uh, version of our project. So it's unpacking a bunch of the data that would have been loaded, say, overnight from Agilon um, and maybe some other sources. It pops into RAM on a server, and then I've got a browser interface to it. Why is Windows not going to install Windows updates right now? Thank you, Microsoft. Uh, so it opens with a ratings page. So this is tiled out. So there's a list of people a page on ratings, a page on staffing, a map of where they live, their affiliation, bio, sports and student activities, giving history, attachment scores. So if I um, look at this page, it's ratings. I've got capacity rating. And I'm looking at 55,000 people. And kind of here's a list of them uh, from Harley Oliver, who's my biggest all-around donor in the bottom of this list. I've got the webinar thing over here. But the bottom of this list has uh, a bunch of smaller donors. So it's a list of everybody. It's a list of the 55,000. And they group. Um, this, this team has 166 of those 55,000 who are rated 50 million or more. Um, the other end, there's looks like 19,000 who are rated 25 to 50,000. There are all these levels in between. And this, you know, this can come from a wealth screen. You can impute it out of wealthy zip codes. There's a variety of ways to get this. So let's just assume this came from somewhere and research has validated it. So if I'm looking at staffing, I probably want to make sure everybody who's rated half a million dollars and up and is highly engaged or an owner is staffed. So that would be these five bars. So if I want to select these, I take the mouse, I just sweep over them. I can hide this panel on the left too. That has selected 6,000. 306 prospects out of everybody. And I can see in here the coloring of those prospects. So um, these are attachment scores. So here we're looking at have they been giving? Have they been coming to events? Uh, do they come to reunions? And if not, they're disconnected. If they come to everything, they're owners. So you'll see this in a minute. But we're looking at the data and we're creating these scores and binning them. And the, what I've made the selection over here in the capacity. I'm seeing that some of the uh, disconnected, looks like at the top, 8.8% .8 of the disconnected, 2,357 people are, are, are high capacity. So I might want to explore why do I have these really high capacity people who are completely disconnected. Um, but I really want to make sure I've got, hopefully, the high capacity more skewed towards highly engaged in owners. So in the owners category, I've got 162 at the top out of 584. 28% of the owners are high capacity. So Clearly, a higher percentage of owners are high capacity. That's good because they should be cultivating them. Highly engaged, looks like 1,365 out of 6,300. 22% of my highly engaged are, are high capacity. Okay, that's that's good. I'm seeing my team is cultivating the higher capacity and they're more engaged. That's good. Now let's drill in. So I'm going to get rid of the gray. Just focus in on these high capacity folks. I'm going to then grab the ones that are also highly engaged owners and drop down to them. So now I've got 1,527 people who are both high capacity and highly engaged. And let's see if they're staffed. This is what we call this visual discovery. I'm just basically taking all my data and slicing it really quickly. Um, so of the 1,527, it looks like 269 aren't staffed. So I, like, I'm going to ask why in a minute. Uh, the other, the others are. Uh, it looks like Megan's got 116. That's a pretty big pool of these top prospects. But oh, okay. Uh, Dan Law, he's got 67, but he's got all the red. So the, I'm colored over here. You can see that the red are the really, really high capacity, and you know the greens and all that are a little lower. So Dan Law's got the really, really high capacity, highly engaged. He's got the, you know, the cream of my crop. So I want to probably keep an eye on this and make sure that he's, he's hopefully one of my best. We want this group. So I click the bar up here, uh, just grab the 269 who are highly engaged uh, owners, high capacity, and aren't staffed. Um, look at the map. So I'm just progressing through this data. Where do they live? Yeah, there's a bunch in the northeast uh, around Boston. Looks like I've got somebody down here in um, 
Milton, uh, somebody up here in whatever that is, uh, Concord, got a bunch in the New York area, somebody out here in uh, Darien, Connecticut, or Westport, Connecticut, this is Darien, Connecticut, and I uh, just want my VPs going to the San Francisco Bay Area. So let's grab that. This is all stuff you can load straight out of Agilon. Um, just grab the Bay Area, visually selected it. Now I've got, uh, back to the first page, uh, where I have a list of them, I've got 24 people who live in the Bay Area, Atherton, California, Portola Valley, San Francisco. Uh, they're all high capacity, they're all highly engaged they're owners, and they're all unstaffed. And then somebody says, okay, let's get this list, but first, what's the giving history that they've been giving? So uh, in total of this 24 people, here they all are, Virginia's given a million three. Um, it's like Georgie's given uh, 800, but a whole lot of them are like really not given much. And as a group, uh, looks like they're up, and there's a spike in 2010-11. Let's take a look at Virginia. Yeah, Virginia was a spike in 2010-11. and 11. Um, The giving detail for her, what's she actually given? I'm down at the gift transaction table. Let's look. This is all of her gifts. Let's look at the hard credit, sort that way. Yeah, like 11, she, she did have a couple of 250,000 gifts and some others, so she had a spike. Um, I could take this group, let's drop out Virginia for a second, exclude her. Here's the group without Virginia. Um, it's still a spike, it looks like maybe Georgie, but in general the group's up, so they're moving in the right direction. They're all engaged, they must be coming to activities, but you know, they're down. Let's bring Virginia back. So and do that and grab them all. And then, uh, I'm going to get off this in a second, but I want to look at what makes up these attachment scores because I'm planning my dinner in San Francisco for my VP. Here's the 24. Uh, let's sort by these scores. So there's a model that gets run in our software uh, that takes a number of volunteer committees in the last 10 years, and here's what it is for all these people, the number of gifts in the last five years, the number of the gifts six to ten years back, uh, the reunions, the student sports and activities, these are all factors that in modeling have contributed to attachment. It creates a higher likelihood of giving. And these people are all at the higher end of this, and so the scores run from you know, zero to like 0 0.9 to be extreme outlier. Uh, there's a group in here that's strong. But as I'm looking at this, and I'm at my dinner, I want to cultivate these people to higher attachment. I mean, I, they can't give anymore. They're given every year. Uh, they've come in all the reunions, they, they, they're graduates, they can't play more sports. But look at this, only uh, Adrian Ever has been on a volunteer committee in the last 10 years. My best cultivation would be to probably get some people who are all into my, my organization at the tables with these people and get them on some committees they can participate in because that will cultivate them more. Great, I got my strategy for my dinner, go back to the first page, I want to export this list out of here, I click this drop it down off the web server, um, stick it up on my desktop, and it's going to be out of here in Excel. You know, here's my list um, ready to go. So I'm going to format this a little bit different. So here's my list of 24. This could have a bunch of other columns. It could have their phone numbers, addresses. So all the entity stuff from uh, Agilon is what you would uh, put in here. So I'm going to go back to here and just, I, you know, that's this literally is so it's a daily update from Agilon, we're synthesizing and binning into scores and groups like this, putting it up on this visual format so you can quickly cut through it and get to answer questions like, do I have any high capacity, highly engaged people who aren't staffed, and where are they, and what are the characteristics of them? And um, back to those first pages in the data, most of you have this data, but it's hard to work with it, so we're, we're in the business of making the data that's there really easy to work with. You get down to your list, set up the dinner, and go. So um, next question, uh, we've got our prospects. We're going to add some in, hopefully from that dinner. Is our pool of assigned prospects being connected with? And typically, what we see is people focus on visits, and they measure development officer activities. And they often look at you know visits fiscal year to date, visits last month, contacts fiscal year to date, contacts last month. And if you look at this, uh, let's focus on Heather Ashford, Daniel Asnes, and John Brown. And it's the middle of the year, and they've got 28 visits fiscal year, 31, 37. So they all look like they're doing pretty good. They're ahead of their peers. Hard to tell whether this is good or bad. 
Um, we like to look at, instead of the fiscal year date, let's look at the visit across a standard time period, for example, last 12 months. Uh, so then you get, you know, something that is stable. So, you know, runs 12 consecutive or 365 days. So it's, you know, it's, it eliminates cyclicality. The fact that it's hard to interview people or meet people in July and August is not an issue because right now it would run back to the, like a whole year. And then we got a little different story. Here it looks like, you know, Heather and John Brown are like kind of higher and Daniel's a little lower and they're like, they actually all are pretty good, but, you know, Gretchen Meyer jumps out here. Um, this whole concept of unique visits gives another look at it. Um, let's just back up. So the unique visits we've got, you know, this is instead of the total how many visits, how many unique people did I visit in the 12 month period. Uh, Heather's got 59, Daniel's 71, John Brown's 41, so his ratio here is low. He looks like he's not getting as many people, but he's doing a lot with visits. And you can show it on a bar chart would flag uh, you know, here's the visits last 12 months we looked at. Um, and I'm going to flag, you know, Michael Ortiz doesn't seem to have many. Um, so we're actually measuring this. We might want to fire Michael because he's not making visits. But hold on, we're going to come back in a minute. He's actually one of my stars. Happens out, he, what he's doing, he's leveraging other people to visit his prospects. He's not personally doing the visits, and he may not be putting them all in the system, but he's actually doing an awesome job. We'll see in a minute. This concept of unique visits, you know, John's got this, but what's up with John Brown is unique visits are really low. Well, here's John Brown's actual visits by prospect. Uh, Cortez wins. He's had 17 visits with Cortez in the last 12 months. Uh, Floyd Agrawal, 16. So John's, and we see this a bunch if you measure activities and figure out the game. I'm going to get measure on visits. Um, good, I'll get a lot of visits in. But what you really want is penetration of the pool, you know, unique visits, not total visits. So we actually like to flip this around um, and you know, get off this activities because this gets artificial time periods of fiscal year, anecdotal stories about the visits, you know, get into like my dinner last Wednesday night with Mark and it drives all that stuff tactically. Uh, and the next question is, you know, the development office would visit, but what about engaging others to visit? Like is it maybe it's better to have the dean and the president visit instead of you do the visits? And then you actually want the discussion about the prospects who weren't visited versus the visits that happened because that may be the key of the portfolio. Which is why we really like to flip off and get away from that sort of tactical view and this much more strategic view. So this is something called a spine plot. And we're looking at, here's Heather Ashford who we're looking at on her visits. And um, this width of this thing is how many prospects she has. So she has uh, 143 prospects, which is a bunch. You can see that John Brown has more. Uh, Daniel Asnes is a little more focused. And then this coloring is, is of her 143, how many has she solicited, visited, or contacted in the last 12 months? So Heather's got the blue, this means they've been solicited and have been visited. Um, this lighter blue is they've been solicited but not visited. That's probably a question, why Heather, do you have so many that you solicited but not visited? The green is they've been visited but not solicited. So this is a higher level of contact. And then the, the, this sort of uh, peach color is uh, they've been contacted in some form other than a visit in the last 12 months. And this ought to be 80 to 85 percent. Heather's at um, 112 out of 143. So she's best to breed here at 78 percent, which is OK. It's a little below typical threshold, but OK. But the rest of this team is just you know, not getting their pool. And this gray. This gray represents assigned prospects who are uncovered. They're just nobody's getting to them. And part of the problem in this situation is the pools are generally too big. If this is a you know 143, uh, these are these are much bigger pools. But part of the problem is you've got some people focusing on um, visits versus unique visits and penetration, like John Brown. I mean, John Brown is um, let's look at John Brown. Um, he's getting to. Uh, I think that's 65 percent with the context of he's only visiting and soliciting 40 percent of his pool. Now let's look at this drop off the pink and just look at the proposal and visited, which is dark blue, um, of the solicitation not visit the light blue and a visit. So this you want to see in the 40 to 50 percent. And you know uh, here we've got Heather's okay, uh, John Brown's a little bit under. 
you know, Daniel, who was doing okay at the beginning, is uh, falling uh, low here. So, you know, he must be visiting multiple people, multiple multiple times per person as well. So this is sort of how you want to start dialogue. And if I was running this team, I'd have a discussion about the pool size and also about uh, effectiveness at reaching people. And I want to have a lot of talk about this group up here, like why, why can't we visit these people? Or back here, you know, why are we unable to get any contact with them at all? What's going on here? Um, and this part is as important as the part that's being connected with. And the point made is, you know, this includes the actions of, this is Heather's pool, of Heather plus the others. If she gets the VP, the dean, and so forth to participate, uh, that's good. And if you look up here, Michael Ortiz, who was about to get fired because he wasn't making the visits himself, he's actually got a pretty good uh, pool penetration. Uh, he's got, you know, a part down here that's visited. He's got a lot in solicitation. Now, I'm going to have a discussion about these are solicited and not visited. Why? But he's got another group up here because he's leveraging some other people. So he's working his pool OK. Um, only concern would be, be this, and, and probably could get out a little more. But he's looking a lot better now than when we just looked at the visits. So next thing we want to look at, are we moving the prospects forward at a reasonable pace? So we use something called a scatter plot. And uh, the horizontal axis is how long they've been in the stage zero, three months, six months, nine months, and then the stage is qualification, cultivation, solicitation, verbal commit, pending close. And each of these circles is a prospect. Uh, so for example, this red one here is uh, Sammy Keneally is the prospect. Tracy Roberts is the staff officer. And cultivation, we've got an expected ask amount of $10 million. So this is going to be a high capacity person who's engaged. Uh, they've not been solicited, but we're anticipating that. And that drives the size of the circle. This is, you can see a big one. But it's been in cultivation 20 months, which is getting long. And so you'd like to see a reasonable progression. Um, you know, one thing from the data, you've got a lot of pending close with the minimum amounts. So it looks like the uh, actual ask probably aren't going in the system uh, all, all the time, which is why that's low. These are calculated down here, so they're getting attached properly. There's some data issues. These should not be these de minimis amounts. But maybe I'm concerned about down here, uh, what's up with, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff and there's some big stuff, expected value and qualification, you know, over six months. You can look at that. Um, what are they? Uh, there's 171 prospects down there. Francesca Peachtree, one of my field officers, has 32, Amanda 25. So this would be a discussion. You know, what's going on here? Can we help you? Why are these taking so long? Is it an issue with the prospects? Or is there some... Um, best practices we can help you with to move the people out of qualification to cultivation because generally a qualification is a six to 12 months uh, process and there's a whole bunch of them here that are you know well over 12 months and you know here we're looking at six months plus there's a lot of, and it's concentrated in a handful of field officers it's not evenly distributed across the team and you could do that with each step along the way and you're going to see different field officers, you know, wrestling with uh, different parts of the transition from cultivation to qualification, cultivation, solicitation, and then up to close. Now let's look at the solicitation levels. Are our, our ask at the right level relative to capacity and attachment? And this is, again, the concept that I have a million dollar uh, capacity prospect who's highly engaged. Um, expected value would say I probably ought to be asking three to $500,000 uh, from that person. Uh, if I'm asking $20,000, I'm leaving money on the table. So we can show that a number of ways. This thing's called a heat map. And what it's doing is taking the teams. This is the leadership giving team, uh, the VP of development or principal giving team, the law school, the mayor program. And it's grouping the field officers into their teams. And the size, and this is Nancy Berrios, uh, is determined by uh, her total ask amount out. And it's colored by the ask to a calculation, calculation we do of the expected value, which is based on capacity and attachment. And big and green is good, and uh, little, and rel little and red is bad. So I see some imbalances. I mean, Nancy seems to be getting solicitations out. John Brown seems to be uh, getting a, his big, so he's got a lot of ask out, but he seems to be under asking. You know, Francesca Peachtree is smaller, but she's bright green, so she's asking. She must have a smaller, lower capacity pool. Um, but she's asking pretty aggressively. I got some issues with the law program. They seem to be systemically under asking the mayor program. And my VP up here, Tracy Roberts, has a huge amount 
of ASCO, but she's orange, which would mean she's got a, a lower coverage ratio of asked to calculated value. And we often see this with VPs. They probably have the very top prospects, and they probably have too big of a pool. And maybe they're getting to the some of that pool, but they're leaving some of the really high capacity people. They can't get at them as much as they like. So they're going to end up on having this not getting the coverage you like. And the typical answer would be to split the pool apart and, and let the VP work on the very top prospects and take some of those lower, lower uh, ones off and reassign them. Um, the size here and then the coloring is an indication of that. Um, and if you look at the solicitation levels, um, if you take John Brown, so we had some concern here. He's red, so his coverage ratio isn't as high as you'd like. Um, this is coloring where his prospects are on that chart we had a minute ago on, on stage moves. So he's got a couple in qualification, a little long, not bad. Cultivation, a few out there. He's getting through solicitation quickly. He's getting to verbal commit quickly. He's getting to pending. So most of his prospects are ahead of the trend line. So, so he's moving them through well, and he's actually got great activity. We saw that earlier. But it looks like he may be under asking. So he's doing a good job in a number of uh, areas. But the coaching tips for him would be, hey, John, um, could we ask a little more out of your prospects? It looks like you may be leaving some money on the table. Uh, another way to look at that, uh, is heat maps, the bar chart does the same thing. We're looking at just taking the field officers from the highest coverage ratio, which again is taking the solicitation totals for her pool and divide it by the expected amount. Um, Francesca's got a ratio of about three, which is why she's green. That's good. Um, you know, Daniel Asnes down here is red. He's down about 0 .02, uh, 0 0.2. 0.2. That's bad. Um, you know, Michael Ortiz is up here at you know 1.6. Uh, and Nancy Barrios, we looked at in the prior charts, up at like two. So you've got some people who are like asking very effectively. And you've got about maybe two-thirds of your pool who appear to be under-asking. Um, generally, when we look at these pools, there's a band of ratios from 1.5 to 2.5 that are you know good. You expect to see uh, above 1.5. And you know we often see a distribution like this. And this is coaching tips for the people down here. I think it goes with that is yields. So here's the same group of people colored by the coverage ratios with green being good and red being low. It's the same coloring as the other chart. And here we're looking at um, the dollars they close uh, in a 12-month period to how much they ask in the same 12-month period. And you've got a few of them, and Heather and Daniel are closed like 100%, but they're bright red. So to go back to the prior chart, you know, Heather and Daniel are probably at the bottom of it. Um, here they are. I mean, their solicitation levels are just low. So these go together, and we see this a lot, and they need to be managed together um, because, you know, this is great. They're closing the stuff, but they're leaving a ton of money on the table. You know, Francesca, who has uh, the most aggressive ask levels, is not closing uh, uh, as much. And generally, you like to see, you know, a 15 to a 30 percent close rate. Anything under 15 is pretty low. Uh, you know, 25, 30 is getting pretty good. You'd like to clear this line. She's low, but she's asking maybe a bit too aggressively. So you take this and summarize it. You know, this is giving you the framework to um, highlight uh, success. And here's Michael Ortiz. I've circled him on both charts. You know, he was bombing on visits this year to date. He was doing pretty good on uh, the penetration. He was doing pretty good on the stage moves. And if you look at what he's bringing in, which is revenue, he's got a, a pretty good ask to expected ratio. He's over 1.5. He's got a yield that's like up about 40%. So I like, I would like to get Michael to talk to my team about how he's managing his prospects to do this. Because that's actually at the high end of this thing, what you want. You want revenue and yield and, and, and coverage ratio, the two key things. So you know, I kind of did some scenarios here. but this is why we really don't like visits fiscal year to date because it can get you to focus on the wrong things. We were about to file fire Michael, you know, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes ago. Now we're actually saying maybe he's one of our you know, really good success stories we want to highlight on this team and use him to share how he's doing this with his um, uh, colleagues. And if you just take another look, there's a couple of others that come up. I'd just like to highlight while we're on this. You know, John Brown. 
Uh, he was nailing on the visits, and he's doing pretty good in yield, but you know his his coverage ratio is low. So the same relationship, you know, if you drop the ask levels down, you're going to get a higher yield, but is that good? You're actually leaving revenue on the table. And we looked at uh, Heather Ashford and uh, Daniel Asnes, who were doing great on visits fiscal year to date. Uh, they're doing pretty good, great on yield, but they're like doing terrible on asking at the right level. So if I'm running this team, I'd probably get the, the ones, you know, colored here just to have some discussions. You know, Michael Ortiz is sort of probably best to breed across both of these. Don Bastilius is uh, closing at a good level, and over here he's got a good ask uh, ratio to the expected value. Amanda's, you know, doing good on ask and a little low on close, but, you know, pretty good. So I get these people, let's, let's have them share what's working. And if you look at the amounts, um, the numbers behind it. Here's my buddy Michael. He's asked 38 million. He's got a you know calculated current year expected amount of 24 million. This is we're calculating this off the capacity of his prospects multiplied by the attachment scores of his prospects. And you'd like to see this ask to this expected amount to be in this you know 1.5 to 3 range. Um, he's 1.6, which is the bar right there. Then he's got an accepted amount of 15 million. So his close ratio is the 15.5 against the 38 ask, which is his 41%. So that's a good ratio. That's a pretty good ratio. Maybe a little higher, but you know this team is pretty good. Um, that's where this comes from. And you know underneath, uh, you know these numbers are pulling from the Agilon system or whatever the underlying data would be to feed this, and then updating daily. So you know, when we do this work, just to close out the the metrics, uh, we really like to see people focus on the positives. And that last page was a great example of that. Have the top performers share with their peers how they achieved the strong solicitation shields, openness, and transparency with the data is really important. And then uh, make this a positive, success-driven thing versus you know you, you miss the metric that's bad. Uh, we've had teams. If you put metrics up, and is a punitive thing. It's, it doesn't work as well as if you turn it into this much more positive, um, how, do, how can I do better theme. And uh, just to summarize, you know, we talked about finding the highest and most engaged prospects. We looked at an example of doing that with the data. We looked at penetration. You know, what percentage of my pool is being connected with in a 12-month period by me or my designates? Am I moving the prospects forward at a reasonable pace? We saw some people getting stuck in qualification. We could continue on others are getting stuck at other stages. Are we asking at the right level relative to capacity and attachment? We had a couple people who were closing really aggressively, but leaving a lot of money on the table based on the, you know, the capacity and engagement of their prospects. And in our work, when you get this right, uh, it's generates more revenue, probably faster closes, and a much better pool value. So the same numbers can be used in campaign planning and analytics. So here I've got an example. I'm planning a campaign. I want to know how much money I can uh, bring in, and, and in by different purpose areas. So I'm loading up a project that's the same data as we looked at a few minutes ago with finding prospects, only this is more about looking at them in groups. And let's let the thing come up. So here I've got you know a gift pyramid uh, of people who are potential $10 million, $10 million plus donors, 5 to $10 million, uh, 1 to $4 million. I've got how many prospects are in each group, what their campaign dollar potential is. And we're calculating this again off the capacity, which come from wealth screening, we saw that a few minutes ago, multiplying it by the attachment score, and then we're subtracting off gifts over the period for which the capacity is, is, is relevant. Well, most of these capacities are like seven year numbers, so if somebody's made a large gift in the last seven years, we'd take that out to get the campaign potential. We do that at the individual level, so we calculate an expected campaign potential, and then we can put them in these groups and sum them. So, you know, of the billion dollar potential for my overall campaign, 26% uh, is, is this 18 people in this top category. And there's another, you know, 20, 30% that's in the one to 
10 million and there's like uh, looks like 120 people there so they hit my numbers I pretty much got to get the top of this thing and I can break it out by school because I know affiliation assigned to a major gift officer sports and other things so if I wanted to like look at the people who played football maybe so I've got my overall campaign as I'm planning this thing out somebody might say uh, how much might be raised from the people with an affiliation with the football team. So I can click the football, and that selects, and let's drop everybody down. That selects, actually I'm going to do it this way. That selects the, uh, the 2,815 people who played football. And I see their class years. Uh, I see they were all from the college. Most of them aren't assigned to an MGO. Uh, 329R. Looks like I've got 76 million of potential. Uh, so if I'm planning out, is it possible to put a new football stadium that think costs 25 million? Yeah, it looks like it's possible because the people who have an affiliation with the football team have a, a campaign potential of 76 million dollars. But you know, it looks like a whole bunch of it's the top 12 million and the 10 million plus one person. There's another two people with 13. So probably want to drill in on this group at the top and make sure I know who they are. Because um, if I'm going to do this, there's 40 million of potential just in those people. Good news is they're all assigned, uh, all 10 of them. Um, you know, what's the, what's they look like? Um, so here's, you know, Annabelle Young. Um, no current solicitation. A 12 million, 13 million dollar campaign ask because the person's rated 50 million has an attachment score of a 0.2, which is highly engaged, and we saw before some of the factors, has given total lifetime 75,000. Uh, as an alum of the college, uh, Michael Ortiz is assigned. That's good, lives in London. And you can sort of go down the list. You know, this one, uh, Lee Mitchell Lee, $8 million, uh, another $50 million. Uh, I could, this high person is given more to date, so that's, you know, coming off um, the potential because he's already given it. And can it kind of go down? I mean, here's a... But this is highly driven by capacity, and they're all like pretty well engaged. So I got the list, and I want to make sure, like, maybe have a discussion with this team uh, about who they are. Um, there are others. Let's back up a step. What about the um, the ones who aren't engaged here? Let's bring stuff back. Grab the football because I remember there was a bunch that weren't um, weren't assigned out of the football. This group. Who are they? So the non-assigned football people, um, yeah, they come up to $12 million. Uh, a couple in here I might want to explore who are, you know, potential half a million to million dollar donors. But if I'm looking at my football, I needed $25 million. You know, it looks like the top of my period is well in hand. Um, probably the top with the field officers. The top prospects are, highly, are, are, most, are all assigned. The ones that aren't assigned tend to be the lower ones. I feel pretty good about this. That's an example of you know using this data to just roll up these expected value into campaign dollar potential and validate whether the initiatives are, are fundable um, by the people we have in the database. And then the next thing is these results. So okay, we got the campaign going, and. Um, this is a dashboard of results. Let me just click on this and open another view. So this is something management would use. Um, got a bunch of cases where this goes out to deans, it goes out to senior managers, it can come in different levels. Um, but here's the entire campaign. And it's uh, showing percent to goal by fund category. Hide this over here. So I've got a bunch of fund categories I'm interested in. Uh, unrestricted endowment, student support, program or faculty support. And my target you know, goal is 100%. This one's already over. Uh, these ones are coming close. These ones are a little behind. Maybe I want to drill on a faculty support so I can click it. Faculty support has um, five funds. It looks like faculty research and support is way over. But professorships, faculty award funds, uh, chair, and whatever this thing is are, are way under um, compared to the, the norms. And I can look at the detail here. Um, got a total of 122 million uh, against the goal of 160. So overall, I'm at 76%, which is the bar over here. But the subcomponents vary widely. 
And these things that are running, you know, uh, small amounts of gold are there's a fifty million dollar uh, for general faculty support commitment that's at five uh, percent. Here's a twenty million that's at you know one point six, which is the chair. So these are running under. Uh, let's uh, drill down and just zoom in on this and go to some of the details. So here we're looking at uh, those save five fund categories. Uh, we're looking by record type. Uh, the blue is alums, corporations. So mostly corporations and foundations so far have been contributing to this. If I want to grab the ones that are really behind, let's grab them, get rid of everything else, and see what's going on. Uh, you have a little bit of alumni and professorships uh, and chair, but these things are so far, the alumni are not participating. What's up with the alumni? Let's grab them and zero in on them, um, get rid of everything else. So here's the alumni to those four funds I'm worried about. And there's one who's given a million. There's some in here. So I, I expected a much bigger top end of the pyramid here. And over time, it looks like it was 2012, it's actually been falling off. So overall, um, when I was at this, this whole uh, fund category, uh, the uh, faculty support, I was feeling pretty good. But now I'm drilling into four of my key funds. And at the detail level, I'm seeing alumni are not being solicited as active as they should be. So this is an area where I've got you know, a couple years left in this campaign. I can um, get my arms around and go forward. Let's bring this back, and we're you know, back to the beginning here. So this is an example of how it's a sort of a scorecard at a high level, but it gives people the ability to explore and drill down all the way to detail and get names out of it and see you know, kind of what's actually happening here underneath. And we do a lot of work in this area, and it helps the team to really understand where to make focus. You know, after you've identified the campaign targets, and you've got the prospects assigned, and now you're trying to like see where the campaign is. So that's another look, largely using the same data, but just formatted and purposed in a different way. So um, I'm going to stop and do questions for a few minutes here. We talked about you know the data acquisition and management, which Agilon does really well. And sometimes some of this data will be in spreadsheets or text files or something outside of Agilon. That's fine. The data gets loaded. It gets synthesized. It gets binned. It gets scored. It gets grouped into formats where people could do discovery and analysis and push it out to a team to, in this case, he looked at finding prospects to assign. And we were surprised there were so many high capacity, highly engaged, unassigned prospects, and a bunch of them in the Bay Area. We, we got the kind of the understood the cultivation. Let's get them on some volunteer committees and get them, get them, get them engaged and assigned and moving. And then we uh, went through metrics from managing the pool once they're assigned, and there were kind of five strategic metrics there. And then we came back to look at like sizing up a campaign and seeing where it was. And that's kind of a good set of things you know, from a major giving perspective that your underlying data is largely there for, and it can be drawn out and synthesized and put in a form where uh, you can do this. So I'm going to stop, and I've uh, got a few minutes for questions. So there's a question panel here where uh, feel free to type in a question, and I'll keep my eyes open for them. And David, feel free to jump in if you have any questions as well. Well, I would I would mention that um, this is highly personalizable to the particular client's way of managing or, or approaching uh, campaigns and that. You might talk a little bit about some of the variations of how you set projects up and, and how that matches needs. Yeah, great point. Uh, so what I went through were templates. Um, when we actually do a project with a client, we start with the needs assessment. Uh, and for example, in that uh, gift officer portfolio management piece with those five strategic initiatives, those are ideal. You know, we get we have clients where they're just not ready for some of that, and expected value and looking at the ask to that maybe too too far in front of where they are. Uh, the data may not all be in the system right now, uh, so it takes a while for that to happen. So yeah, the, I think. These are ideal, and when we implement, we're trying to understand you know, what the client's needs are, uh, where they are with data, 
how they perceive data, how they interact with it, what's overkill versus what actually will help them move forward. And even the, the page layouts, you know, you saw, let me just back up a couple here. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a page we would call as a moderate page. It's got, you know, a set of graphics um, on it. Uh, it could come in, you could back the graphics off and put more lists. We can adjust style. We can put richer or uh, lighter pages up depending on the community and how they generally are comfortable interacting with data. And I'd also say, you know, if we're going out to field officers, we probably want really crisp, clean pages that are certainly no more dense than this. So long-winded way of saying, yeah, you've seen templates and they're nuanced and as we deploy them, we really try to understand where the client is because if the team, and the team is managers and field officers and prospect research people and the, the actual people doing the work aren't comfortable with what they're getting, uh, it's not going to serve a purpose and we, we get that. So it, with that, categories, breakdowns, the different um, details you see here really match their data. You're, they're not having to conform to some predetermined model. Yeah, right. If you look at this, I'm going to load this up again. It's a little bit bigger on the screen. All this, all these labels and things are, like if I look at this, these are coming right out of the database, and we may put the numbers on to order them or something. But, you know, you were working with the fields that you have in Agilon. We could transform them and do what you want with them, but um, we are, yeah, they're, they're coming out of data and can be adjusted to your you're liking. Also with the gift calculations, we're aware that schools and, and providers do different things with how soft credit's attributed, whether they're giving you know, it's a household or an entity, um, what happens to pledges versus pledge payments. All of that's you know, going to be mapped back to how you define it. Um, and so the numbers also would foot back to how you define it. Another thing I might mention is your team is really experienced in implementing these. You mentioned that you have, uh, what, 200 some clients in the, the nonprofit space, so you're really, really aware of what works best and, and what best practices are. Yeah, I think we we're probably up to around 300 now, and, and um, you use the word best practices. We, what you've seen here are best practices, and we'll come in and we'll present them to a team. And we may back off best practices in terms of just being practical and getting something that's comfortable out, but we're going to try to draw a team towards best practices. So like those field officer portfolio metrics, like some of that may be beyond where the team currently is, that's fine. Uh, and we, are, we obviously will do things with metrics, fiscal year data and all that if that's what the team is really wedded on, but we're going to try to draw them into the you know, the more best practices over time. And yeah, clients are at different points. I mean, Dave, these, David, these are great points. And it's like the, one of the challenges of deploying something like this is it, it, it's, it's not a cookie cutter because people are different in their expertise and their life cycle and their expectations. And it needs to be whatever, whatever all of you do, it needs to be matched into the people expectations. Good questions. Um, others. We always get questions about like what does it take to implement one of these? Um, and you know there are a number of Agilon clients that um, if you're interested in hearing from them firsthand, uh, just connect back to uh, David or me. I'm looking at questions in the webinar. Let me get out of the browser, my contact information is on the last page here. Uh, but generally, you know, we're taking, it depends on, to implement one of these, the state of the data and the availability of the client for review sessions. But generally, we're running six to maybe 12, 13 weeks to get a project up and running from scratch, from start. Um, you know, we obviously need uh, access to data. Uh, we usually build on a machine on premise uh, with access to the database. And then we, my team, can do the calculations, the binning, the transforms, all the synthesis, and then we'll train on what we did. And our, our ideal is that after we've done it, the team can pick it up and own it. Our authoring is, in our world, an Excel-savvy author should be able to author the types of projects I just went through. The challenge is the data is rich, and especially the first time through trying to create you know, attachment scores out of 
all this data that needs to be binned and synthesized is it's tricky. So most of our clients would prefer us to do it because we've done it a bunch of times. But then once it's done, it's like it's like an Excel. You can change the macros and change the calculations that way. Um, we also um, can deploy on premise, which is typically how we deploy because usually the data is there. We also have hosted offerings, so we can um, load data from wherever and then run it. We run on Amazon Web Services with a managed cloud offering, which some of our clients prefer. Other questions? I realize we're right at our time limit here. And any of you who would like to do a more detailed look uh, or even look at other types of data management, um, contact either Agilon or Advisor, and uh, we'll definitely get you some more, uh, more looking at the tool set. Yeah, and we do have a whole set of the demos I've run through here, if you emailed back, they're up on a, a user group page so we can make the link available uh, so you can interact with one of these as well. Um, and we do have you know, quite a number of reference accounts um, in varying areas of that pyramid of different user types and uh, a number of them you know, are agile on accounts which we'd be glad to introduce you to. Well, thank you, Doug. We really appreciate you spending time with us today. and. If there aren't any more questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay. Let's, yeah. Thank you all for uh, listening and uh, the attention, and uh, you know how to reach us. And uh, David, I think we've recorded this, so I'll get you the recording in like a day or so, and we can then post it out. We'll do. Thank you, Doug. All right. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. <laughs>